<laughs> and which one to talk to? Um, yeah, welcome to a what I my name's Sandra Griffin and I um, um, I'm from a Warrenai, a Wabika tribe, and I congratulate you on being here with us and I look forward to you walking working with a lot of our our people who work within the diocese. And I used to work a lot with with the um, uh, with Catholic Church in uh, Vermont. I just love it, and my brother is my mother and my ancestors, and also uh, my children look after all who are working, and in particular you. Thank you so much.
Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, it's a joy to be with you this evening for the installation of the Most Reverend Michael Kennedy as the ninth Bishop of Maitland, Newcastle. I thank the erstwhile administrator of the diocese, the very Reverend Father Greg Barker, and the consultants for their welcome. Theirs was the duty of leading you after the untimely death of Bishop Bill Wright, to whom we pay tribute tonight. He gave himself totally to the service of the people of this diocese from day one of his appointment, leading some important pastoral developments. He was a champion of survivors of abuse and of church reforms to help the church better respond to these matters. He served the National Church on the Bishop's Commissions for Church Ministry, for Ecumenism and Interfaith Relations, for Evangelization, Laity and Ministry, and for social justice, mission and service, and of course, for professional standards. All on top of his day job here in Maitland, Newcastle. A warm, considered and deeply faithful man with a wry wit, he had a great capacity for sitting patiently with people, especially down and outs, joining them in a cigarette and a beer, till as late as was needed. He was a good shepherd. I acknowledge tonight His Excellency, the Apostolic Nuncio to Australia, representing His Holiness Pope Francis, and many bishops of Australia. I greet the priests, deacons, religious and lay faithful of the Church of Maitland Newcastle. This is a night of great rejoicing for you all, and for all those throughout the diocese. I welcome visiting priests and people from outside the diocese, especially those from Armadale who must this night let go of their pastor. And of course, all those joining us by live streaming. A warm hello to the Bishop's proud family, his brothers and sister, a small army of 25 nieces and nephews, and the rest of his extended family. I also greet representatives from other churches and faiths joining us the, this evening. Reverend Dr. Peter Stewart, Bishop of the Anglican Diocese of Newcastle. Sheikh Mohammed Khamis of the Walzen Mosque in Newcastle and Major Mark Everett, local area officer of the Salvation Army Australia. From civic life, I acknowledge Sharon Clayton, federal member for Newcastle, Meryl Swanson, Federal Member for Patterson, David Gillespie, Federal Member for Lynn, Councillor Dr Elizabeth Adamsick, representing the Lord Mayor of Newcastle, and Councillor Mitchell Griffin, Deputy Mayor of Maitland. When I was a boy, we undertook such heroic penances as renouncing the eating of chocolate or ice cream for the whole of Lent. This was a grave mortification indeed. But the hardship was lightened by knowing exceptions would be made for the solemn feasts of the Annunciation of St Joseph and, of course, St Patrick, today's hero. This legendary 5th century evangelist almost single-handedly converted the Emerald Isle from its pagan kings down to its simplest folk. He was a tireless traveller, prepared to go wherever necessary to preach the good news. It was his children in Ireland who largely established the Catholic Church in Australia. In this diocese alone, there are churches dedicated to him in Clarence Town, Carangbong, Cundletown, Lochinvar, Singleton, Swansea and Walsend, and some schools. When you add the churches dedicated to his friends Bridget, Kevin, Columba, Columbanus, Lawrence O'Toole, and that most Irish of saints, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, <laughs> the Irish have certainly left their mark. And so it's appropriate that today we install a bishop with a name like Michael Kennedy. 
Unlike St. Patrick, Bishop Michael should not have to deal with slavers or druids, chieftains or wild boar in Maitland, Newcastle. But like Bishop Patrick, he will be charged with leading, sanctifying and teaching. In his case, more than 150,000 Catholics stretching from Lake Macquarie to Taree and as far inland as Meroe and Murundi. These times call for the zeal of a Patrick, courageously preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to all people. Pope Francis has expressed his confidence that Bishop Michael is the man for the job. And so before we install him, I must ask His Excellency Archbishop Charles Balvo, is there a mandate from the Holy See? There is. Then let it be read. The consultors have seen the Latin original, and I will read the English translation. <clears throat> Francis, Bishop, Servant of the Servants of God, to Venerable Brother Michael Robert Kennedy, hitherto Bishop of the Diocese of Armadale, translated to the See of Maitland, Newcastle, Health and Blessing. As a missionary of the gospel in the image of Jesus Christ and in his footsteps, the bishop also goes out to the world to proclaim him the savior of every human being. The bishop acts in the name of the church, which has experience of humanity and is close to the human beings of our age. Confer St. John Paul II, Pastoris Gregi, 66. Therefore, the solicitude of pastors, of protectors of justice and of peace, is of the greatest importance for the good of the faithful. But since we now wish to appoint to the community of Maitland, Newcastle, after the death of the venerable brother William Wright, a new protector, we turn our attention to you, venerable brother, who have acquired through these years a solid and secure skill in the Episcopal ministry to attend to the government of that diocese. Therefore, having heard the counsel of the Dicastery for Bishops employing our apostolic authority, we name you Bishop of Maitland, Newcastle with the addition of the rights and obligations respecting the same office, according to canon law, the bond of the former see having been dissolved. You will, of course, carefully see to it that this, our letter, is made known to the clergy and people of your diocese, all of whom we exhort to have for you esteem, obedience, fitting cooperation, and love. Finally, venerable brother, we exhort you that in the likeness of Holy Church, which is a sacrament in the world of close conjunction with God and of the unity of the whole human race, you be a strenuous defender and father of every human being, but especially of the poor and the sick, 
solicitous for the sheep of your community and the bearer of great hope. Given at Rome, the Lateran, on the second day of the month of February, on the feast of the presentation of the Lord, in the 2023rd year of the Lord, the 10th of our pontificate. And it is signed by the Holy Father Francis and by William Millay, Protonotary Apostolic.
A reading from the prophet Jeremiah. The word of the Lord was addressed to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you came to birth, I consecrated you. I have appointed you as prophet to the nations. I said, Our Lord, I do not know how to speak. I am a child. But the Lord replied, do not say I am a child. Go now to those to whom I send you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to protect you. It is the Lord who speaks. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, There, I am putting my words into your mouth. The word of the Lord.
Second reading, a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. We must turn to the Gentiles. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly to the Jews. We had to proclaim the word of God to you first. But since you have rejected it, since you do not think yourselves worthy of eternal life, we must turn to the pagans. But this is what the Lord commanded us to do when he said, I have made you a light for the nations, so that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. It made the pagans very happy to hear this, and they thanked the Lord for his message. All who were destined for eternal life became believers. Thus the word of God spread through the whole countryside. This is the word of the Lord. From the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The Lord appointed seventy two others and sent them out ahead of him in pairs to all the towns and places he himself was to visit. He said to them, the the harvest is rich, but the laborers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest to send laborers to his harvest. Start off now, but remember I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Carry no purse, no haversack, no sandals. Salute no one on the road. Whatever house you go into, let your first words be peace to this house. And if a man of peace lives there, your peace will go and rest on him. If not, it will come back to you. Stay in the same house, taking what food and drink they have to offer. For the labourer deserves his wages. Do not move from house to house. Whatever house you go into, let your first words be peace to this house. And if a man of peace lives there, your peace will go and rest on him. If not, it will come back to you. 
stay in the same house, taking what food and drink they have to offer, for the labourer deserves his wages. Do not move from house to house. Whenever you go into a town where they make you welcome, eat what is set before you. You are those in it who are sick and say, the kingdom of God is very near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not make you welcome, go out into the streets and say, we wipe off the very dust of your town that clings to our feet and leave it with you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is very near. I tell you, on that day, it will not go as hard with Sodom as with that town. The 72 came back rejoicing. Lord, they said, even the devil submit to us when we use your name. He said to them, I watch Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Yes, I have given you power to tread underfoot serpents and scorpions and the whole strength of the enemy. Nothing shall ever hurt you. Yet do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Rejoice rather that your names are written in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. The Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out ahead of him. What a great privilege and responsibility it is to share Jesus' work and mission with him, to prepare the way for him. Jesus has come to bring God's love, mercy, joy, peace and salvation to the world but he does not want to do it alone. He wants to do it in communion with others, in communion with you and me. So one of the first things Jesus does when he begins his public life is to form a community of people around him and he sets about teaching and preparing them to do what he does to think like he does, and to love like he does. We are now that community. Jesus had already appointed the 12 whom he called apostles, and now he appoints 72 others and sends them out to do two things, to proclaim the kingdom to preach, and to cure the sick, which I suggest can represent the sacraments which heal us and give us strength. We recognise this mission of the 12 and the 72 
as carried on today by the bishops and priests who are called and sent by Jesus, sharing in his mission in a particular way and whose ministries are essential to the life of the church. But you know, the most recognisable and most often repeated words of Jesus from today's gospel passage are these. The harvest is rich, but the labourers are few. So ask the Lord of the harvest to send labourers to his harvest. We bishops and priests are indeed relatively few. Jesus' mission cannot and must not be left just to the ordained ministers. We are all called and sent by Jesus to bring God's love, joy, peace and mercy into the world. From earliest times, the church always understood that Jesus calls and sends every baptised person as a missionary into the world. Not necessarily to the very ends of the earth like St. Patrick, but each of us sent out into our own worlds where we live, work and play. The Vatican II decree on the laity reinforced in our own modern times this ancient understanding and practice. It said that we are all incorporated into Christ by our baptism, that we are all strengthened by the Holy Spirit in our confirmation, and that we are all assigned a mission or apostolate by Jesus. It goes on to say that we do this by the testimony of our Christian life and good works, and by looking for opportunities to announce Jesus Christ by our words, so by our words and our actions. Being sent out by Jesus does not always mean having to go somewhere. But as Pope Francis likes to emphasise, it does always involve Jesus calling us to come out of ourselves, out of our hesitancy, anxiety and even fear, to come out of our routine and our comfort zones to share the love of God with others in real ways through our words and actions. One person called out of himself by the Lord and sent by him to the ends of the earth or at least their understanding of the earth at the time, was St. Patrick. With Irish descendants, both from my, on my mother's and father's side, I am indeed pleased to be installed as your bishop on this solemn feast day of St. Patrick, Bishop and Apostle of Ireland. Not Irish himself, but British, his initial connection with Ireland whilst a teenager was not a happy one. Captured during a raid by Irish slave traders and taken against his will to the Emerald Isle, he was sold as a slave to an Irish landowner and put to work tending sheep. He spent much of his days praying to God whereby his relationship with the Lord grew to include visions and messages. One such message, after six years of slavery, led Patrick on his escape route and back home. Years later, however, he would return as bishop to the people that had enslaved him so that he might set them free with the proclamation of the gospel. Such heroic feats as these are indeed possible for one who has truly encountered Jesus Christ and experienced his mercy and love. Perhaps we often underestimate 
what we who have also experienced God's mercy and love are truly capable of when we trust in him. Perhaps the best known story about St. Patrick, which comes to us from Irish folklore, is that he drove all the snakes out of Ireland. It is said that he was attacked by serpents while undertaking a 40-day fast on a hilltop. So he drove his staff into the ground, sending not only those serpents, but all the snakes of Ireland into the sea. Whilst Jesus did say in today's Gospel, yes, I have given you power to tread underfoot serpents and scorpions and the whole strength of the enemy, it is more likely that Ireland's lack of snakes is due more to her climate and geography. Given the biblical use of the serpent to represent evil, Perhaps the serpents that attacked Patrick during his fast were more spiritual in nature, akin to the temptations of the evil one which attacked Jesus during his 40-day fast, or akin to the temptations that you and I endure. Perhaps these were the serpents that Patrick defeated. The story of ridding Island of Snakes may also be a metaphor for another thing said of St. Patrick, that he drove the pagans out of Ireland. Truth be told, just like the snakes, Patrick did not drive the pagans out either, but he did something better. He loved them in God. He brought them the gospel of Jesus Christ and he converted them. Whilst each one of us, like St. Patrick, is called out of ourselves by the Lord and sent out by him to others, none of us are likely to compare ourselves with St. Patrick. Most of us probably think that we're not adequately prepared or ready. You're probably right. But so what? Jesus did not wait for his 72 disciples to be fully formed and ready either before sending them out on mission. They were only partway through their training with him and he hadn't yet given them the Holy Spirit. So they were even less ready than you and I. But he sent them out. There is urgency to the mission of Jesus Christ. As important as preparation is, there is not time to wait to be fully prepared. Jesus wants us to give it a go. We might feel a bit clumsy or awkward, but he is with us. We will experience the joy of sharing in the mission of Jesus and our efforts will bear fruit. Together, let us profess the faith of the Church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under one child, was crucified and died and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last Amen. We are the Church, called and sent by God to proclaim the good news to the world. Let us pray for our needs and the needs of the world. For all church leaders, especially Pope Francis, Bishop Michael, and all those in the Ministry of Leadership in this Church of Maitland, Newcastle, that they will speak boldly, inspiring the faithful and enlightening the world. God of peace, for the world, that the hearts of all people shall be open to the movement of the Spirit of God, who fills the whole world offering peace and justice, mercy and compassion. God of peace, for this great Southland of the Holy Spirit, that all who call Australia home will be united in forging a path of reconciliation and justice in response to the needs of First Nations peoples. God of peace, for this Church of Maitland, Newcastle, that the Holy Spirit will refresh our response to the Gospel call to go out to all the world and tell the good news. God of peace, for the people of our streets and neighbourhoods, especially the poor, the abused, the victims of violence, the homeless, and all who struggle in these challenging times that their voice will be heard and their needs addressed respectfully. God of peace, yeah. for Bishop Michael Kennedy, that he will feel the touch of the Lord, inspiring his presence and words as the shepherd of this church of Maitland, Newcastle. God of peace, yeah. for those who have gone before us and on whose shoulders we stand that they may see God face to face. God of peace. God, your spirit fills the whole world. Inspire and strengthen us as you send us out as laborers for your harvest. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.
and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Amen. Rejoicing in the gift of faith, O Lord, we bring you these offerings. Grant that, through the present example of St. Patrick, our lives may be united to Christ our Saviour in a holy sacrifice of praise. Through Christ our Lord. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, and me, your unworthy servant and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants. And all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, for they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them. For the redemption of their souls, in hope of health and well-being, and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysostomus, John, and Paul, Cosmas, and Damian, 
and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers in all things, we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, in giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Remember, O Lord, your servants who have gone to before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, 
who though sinners hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share in the, and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon. Through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord, you sanctify them and fill them with life. Bless them and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory, and the glory, and the glory. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your Church, and to graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace.
Let us pray. Strengthen us, O Lord, by this sacrament, so that we may profess the faith taught by St. Patrick and proclaim it by our way of living. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. I think the temperature here is about 20 degrees warmer than I've become accustomed in Armadale. <laughs> I always said I prefer a warm climate, now I'm not so sure. <laughs> I love it. Although all were welcomed at the beginning of Mass by Archbishop Fisher, I want to very simply add my own personal thank you to the many bishops of Australia, to the local faith leaders and to the civic leaders and representatives for your attendance this evening. Your presence and participation have added significantly to our celebration and reinforced for me a sense of welcome. In particular, I thank the Apostolic Nuncio, His Excellency Archbishop Charles Balvon and Archbishop Anthony Fisher of Sydney, not only for their respective roles in tonight's liturgy, but also for their personal encouragement and support. On behalf of the Diocese of Maiden, Newcastle, I express a vote of gratitude to Father Greg Barker for his leadership as diocesan administrator these past 15 months, during what is always a difficult time for a diocese between bishops but particularly so given the untimely passing of Bishop Bill Wright. I was always impressed by Bishop Bill's humanity, his kindness, his respect for people with different opinions, and his good humour. May the good Lord grant me some dose of these same qualities. And it's a privilege to be installed as your bishop this evening with Bishop Bill's crozier. As you would realise, many people have gone to great lengths to prepare for all aspects of this evening's installation. Liturgy, music, catering, logistics. So I thank Father Matt Muller, Miss Elizabeth Doyle, Father Andrew Dewan, Sister Louise Gannon, Mrs Kirsty Boyle, their teams, and all the staff who have volunteered for extra work and difficulties. For all that is seen and unseen, I am truly grateful. In 2013, Pope Francis said that he dreams of a missionary church in which everything we do is geared towards the spreading of the gospel rather than our self-preservation. What most impressed me upon my first ever visit to Newcastle last month was to find a local church looking outward with a missionary focus to spread God's word and love. I know that a particularly shameful and traumatic part of the story of our diocese is the abuse of children, young and vulnerable people, and the failure of the church and some of its leaders to respond properly to this evil and to the individuals harmed. The ramifications of these failings remain current to this day for some people. Like Bishops Bill and Michael before me, who sends his apology tonight, I apologise unreservedly and say sorry. And I recommit myself and the diocese to actions to work towards healing the horrors they have suffered and to promote the safeguarding of all who participate in the life of our diocese. The Lord said to Jeremiah in our first reading this evening, here comes homily number two. 
Go now to those to whom I send you and say whatever I command you. For many years I have found my joy and fulfilment in saying yes to the Lord, in going wherever I am sent. So it is with real joy that I begin my ministry as your bishop tonight, with trust in God and with your prayers and support. It is no accident, and you would have noticed it this evening, that in the liturgy for the installation of a new bishop, the first thing the new bishop does once he becomes bishop by sitting on this chair is meet some of the people of the diocese and the region. Go now to those to whom I send you, said the Lord. The first thing I need to do as your bishop is go to you, or rather come to you, and get to know you, your gifts, challenges, hopes, joys, and sorrows. Then having met you, or some of you at least, the ones who came up here, and some of you meeting me, we then listen to the word of God together. Only then did the church ask me to preach to you to break open the word of God with you. I cannot preach the gospel to you effectively unless I know you. And I must not preach my own message to you, for I have no message to give, not one that can save anyway. No, I must preach the gospel to you, Jesus' message of God's love, mercy and redemption. Go now to those to whom I send you, and say whatever I command you, said the Lord. The sacred liturgy this evening then progressed as is usual to the liturgy, uh, which is always the case to the liturgy of the Eucharist, where our communion with Jesus Christ and with each other is renewed and strengthened. What a joy for me to celebrate the sacred mysteries with you and for you as your bishop for the first time this evening. I am blessed to have had a happy upbringing in a loving family, a blessing that every person deserves. I am delighted to have so many of my family here tonight. For the past 11 years, I have been very happy serving as Bishop in the Diocese of Armadale. And so I'm also pleased that some of the priests and people of Armadale are also here. The Lord has now sent me here to you, to the Church of Maitland, Newcastle. But it is no longer you and me, it is we. We together are the local church of Maitland, Newcastle. I am so happy that there are people here from every parish and region of the diocese. I now look forward to getting to know you better, each in your local parish and region, and to us working together to proclaim Jesus Christ and the gospel of God's love and salvation. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Immaculate Heart of Mary, pray for us. St. Patrick, pray for us. Please stand for the final blessing. Just in case anyone is unsure, there are refreshments available in the Southern Cross Hall, which is that way. <laughs> the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Bow down for the blessing. May God, the Father who called us together to celebrate the solemnity of St. Patrick, bless you, protect you, and keep you faithful. Amen. 
may Christ the Lord, King of heaven and earth, be close to you at all times and shield you from every evil. Amen. And, and may the Holy Spirit make you rich in holiness like St. Patrick and fill you with love for God's people. Amen. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son,